welcome everybody to our next and last of this year Legal Tech Institute program. Today's program is uh, sort of a, an overall survey of the, the topic that we usually treat and uh, uh, today's presenter was Emily Lawson. She is a legal reference and research librarian over at uh, University of Houston O'Quinn Law Library. She's been there for about eight years and has focused on uh, legal technology as well as health law research. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Emily to tell you about legal practice technology. Thank you, and thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, I know it's not the, the best weather out there and it's the end of the year, so thank you. As Joe mentioned, I'm going to be talking about legal practice technology today. Um, and so I just want to start off with a little bit of an overview of what I'm going to be discussing. Um, we'll start off with a little bit of background information about lawyers and technology and how they use it. But then the bulk of this presentation is really going to be kind of going through different types of law practice software and the things that could be useful for attorneys. And then I'll talk a little bit um, about things that you might want to consider when you're selecting law practice technology and then some free websites and things that you can use to stay up to date. Uh, in this particular area because it is something that is changing all the time. So like I said to start off I have a little bit of information about technology use by solo and small firm attorneys. Um, this information comes from the ABA Tech Report um, and the 2017 edition of the Tech Report actually just posted to the ABA's website I believe this morning. I was checking last week and it didn't come up and so I've tried to update these statistics um, with that latest information. It's kind of hot off the presses. And basically what this shows is that many solo and small firm attorneys are using various technologies like case management software, time and billing software, cloud computing, document assembly software. And if you look at the percentages, they show that roughly half of this group is using this stuff. Sometimes it's a little more, sometimes it's a little less, it just depends. However, there is a significant percentage that isn't using this. And I always, I pulled this information for solo and small firms because they tend to be a baseline. As you get into larger law firms, um, this number just tends to go up on all these various types of technology. So solo and small firms are kind of a baseline. I also pick them because they're the ones who are really in a position the most to actually choose and make their own choices about what practice technology uh, their particular form, firm uses. So about half are using this, about half aren't. Um, the ABA also asked solo and small firm attorneys what type of IT support staff they have to help them with technology issues. And what they found is that the majority of these attorneys do not have any sort of IT or tech support. Um, basically, these attorneys are needing to teach themselves these technologies. They're the ones who are having to go out find out what's available, train themselves, or have the vendor train them on um, what's available. Or it's possible that these attorneys are just basically ignoring that these types of technologies actually exist. And so the question becomes, if attorneys are ignoring that this type of technology is available for them to use in their practice, how big of a problem is that really? Um, does that just mean they're not working as efficiently as they should be? They're taking a little bit extra time to do certain things? Or is there some sort of ethical obligation to incorporate technology into the practice of law? Do they, do they need to be knowledgeable about tech issues? Some of you may know that a few years ago, the ABA model rules, um, they updated ABA model rule 1.1 on attorney competence. And the comment to the rule was amended to state that a lawyer should keep abreast of changes in the law and its practice, including the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. So obviously this is a model rule. What does that really mean for you? Since about 2013, 28 states have adopted this particular language into their own model rules of professional conduct. So the states are definitely moving in this direction in making sure that they're having an ethical obligation for attorneys to be aware of technology and maybe incorporate that into their practice of law. Texas is not there yet. But you see, in just a matter of four years or so, 28 states have jumped on board. So it could be coming that Texas is going to be wanting their attorneys to think a little bit harder about technology issues. Um, so it's important to make sure you have some familiarity with law practice technology. You may not like technology. You may decide not to adopt a particular type of technology. Maybe it's not right for your practice. But what I would say is that you need to at least have some knowledge of the type of technology that's going to be available out there and kind of how to use it and what your options are. Um, so that's hopefully what we're going to talk a little bit about today, kind of what's available um, for attorneys to use. 
So the bulk of my presentation is really going to talk about some of these different services and I'll briefly touch on each one, um, all the different types of software that may be available out there. There are more, these are the ones I kind of had time to cover today and these are kind of widely used, uh, but I'll talk about practice or case management software, time and billing software, um, document assembly, cloud computing, e-discovery, I'll talk a little bit about mobile apps and then a little bit at the end about office software. And I'll explain to you why I've included that uh, today. So kind of starting off with case management or practice management software. The name for this may vary. There is a little bit of confusion. People call it different things. But basically, it's software that allows an attorney to effectively manage uh, their practice day to day. Um, the features will vary depending on the type of software you have. Um, often, they'll have the things that I've listed um, up here on this slide. Some attorneys have separate software that do all of these things, but some attorneys choose to have a more of a comprehensive practice management software that will do these. So case management features going to allow you to organize you know, all your client files or all your different things for different client matters. Information is accessed through a centralized database. All attorneys in the firm can access it um, as well. Contact management features allow you to track your communications with clients phone, email, other means, making sure you're following up, setting callback reminders, and that sort of thing. Um, time tracking allows you to record your billable time, obviously really important for an attorney. Um, typically, they'll be flexible enough to allow for hourly billing, transactional billing, contingency fee, whatever you've kind of fee arrangement you've set up. Um, oftentimes, they will often link to billing and accounting features that will kind of help you manage the, that side of the firm, so it's not just the time tracking but it's also um, all the accounting features that the firm may have to um, take care of in the course of your business. Calendaring and docketing allows you to keep track of all your appointments, your deadlines, may help you calculate filing deadlines, rule-based cal calendaring and that sort of thing. Often these are integrated into a more comprehensive practice management software. And then finally, some will also have a document assembly um, feature built in to kind of help you draft documents and create templates and that sort of thing. So we'll talk a little bit more about these as separate software that can do these things, but practice management software tends to be kind of the catch-all. And there are some products that will have all of these features um, in them as well. So the ABA Tech Report has information about the most popular choices for solo and small firm attorneys. Uh, popular choices are listed here, Time Matters, Amicus, Case Map. I don't know if any of you are using these things. I don't know if the county attorney's office has a practice management software that you guys use. Um, any, if you have a particular one um, that you really like to use day to day, feel free to show it out, uh, shout it out. But um, you know, these are the ones that they kind of highlight as attorneys, solo and small firm attorneys, saying these are the ones we like, these are the ones we use. So I wanted to highlight these um, for you here. <clears throat> there are also some cloud-based practice management softwares, and we'll talk about cloud-based services um, at another point in this presentation. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about cloud computing. So the ABA has put together a chart comparing the costs and all of the different features of the different case management softwares. And it was last updated in February. So I anticipate that they are going to update it again in the, in the new year. But it's a really helpful tool, so I always like to point people out. I put a link in the presentation, and the slides will be available online. And what you can see the little columns that run across the top. There's information about pricing, so how much do you have to pay per month per user to have this particular software. Information about the technical requirements. You're going to get, have to get a new computer to run this thing. Is, there only, is it going to take Windows XP or something like that that you may have running on your old computer? Um, what are the front office tasks that will help you with? Calendaring, uh, document assembly, and that sort of thing. What are the back office tasks? Does it have an accounting type program built in to help you with billing and that sort of thing? Also, what other types of software is it compatible with? Uh, that's something you may want to know as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Is there a mobile version of this that you can access? And then finally, stuff about technical support. It becomes really important when, if your practice management software breaks down. Are they going to be able to kind of help you get in there and figure out what's going on with it <coughs> when you have some sort of deadline looming? And so it goes through. This is about I think it's about 29 pages long, this particular chart, and it goes through various technologies um, and provides all of this information for each one. Okay, 
So if you don't think practice management software is right for you, there are some separate options. Like I said before, some people want to bundle them and some people want to separate them. So time and billing software is going to allow you to do a number of different things. It may not do all of these things, but these are the features that they generally make available. Obviously, it's going to allow you to track your billable time. Really important, like I said, for attorneys, select the fee arrangement, hourly, transactional, contingency, some sort of flat fee. Um, these types of software can accommodate um, all of those different scenarios. But it will do more than that, typically. Um, maybe you want to generate client invoices. So you work in your software, and you want to generate automatically client invoices, <clears throat> and then securely email them out. Um, to your clients via some sort of client portal or something like that. You can do that um, in some of these particular softwares. You may also securely, like I said, send them e via email. You may also want to manage your other firm bills. So for instance, payments you may be making to vendors. So you need office supplies. You need to buy your O'Connors. You need to maybe have a, a subscription to Westlaw. You have vendors that you have to, to pay um, as well, and so this can also help you make those payments for all of those things you need to make your firm function. And then they can also help with trust accounting so that you can kind of keep your client funds um, separate from uh, your firm funds and that sort of thing. Okay. So again, the ABA Tech Report provides some information about the most popular choices for solo and small firm attorneys. They include time slips, QuickBooks, um, which isn't really geared toward attorneys, it's a kind of a general accounting software. Um, but some attorneys do like to use it. Tabs 3, PC Law, and Elite. Some of these, I believe Elite is a Thomson Reuters project, product. So some of the big um, legal vendors, they also you know, provide uh, these types of practice management solutions as well. Um, some time and man billing softwares are going to be compatible with a case management software. So if you're the type that you didn't want your own practice management, software that's more comprehensive, you may um, you know, say I want a case management software and a time and billing software and so you can make sure that those two are compatible so that anything you do in your case management software will automatically be captured for purposes of billing. So if you're in your management software and you're drafting something, it will say, okay, you worked for such and such amount of time drafting this motion for this client and it will be captured for purposes of billing. Um, so that's important is trying to make sure those things are compatible. The ABA um, also has a comparison chart for time and billing software. Let me click on that really fast. It's actually the same one that I showed you before, um, but page basically 18 through 29 is going to be the, t the time and billing stuff, and it has a lot of the same information, but it also has some stuff that's specific to time and billing, such as the type of billing that's supported, hourly, transactional, that sort of thing. Also interesting, data conversion, whether that's available. So say you want to switch your billing software, you want to convert that data. This will tell you, we will convert data from tabs three to this new product. So that's really important so that you can still capture that information um, in the new product. So it will tell you things like that, kind of the technical things that you may not think of when you're selecting a product, but when you actually go to switch and implement it can be really, really important. And there's document assembly software. Um, and really the purpose of this is to help you with the standardization um, of legal forms, make you a more efficient attorney. Um, you don't have to start from scratch on your forms. Obviously, most of you have probably created, for certain things that you do all the time, you've created your own templates. Um, but there are various types of document assembly software. Some are going to allow you to build your own templates for frequently used documents. And then there are others um, that will allow you to purchase a package of kind of pre-crafted forms that may be jurisdiction specific or practice area specific. So you may say, I want the Texas estate planning set of forms, you know, in a kind of an online version so that I can draft all of my wills and start kind of have sort of a starting point for everything that I want to then customize for all of my clients. Sub will allow you to do both types of things. It just depends um, on the software solution uh, that you choose. Okay, so there was also information um, from the ABA website about some of the popular choices of these for solo and small firms, hot docs, pro doc, uh, pro law. Um, pro doc is really popular here in Texas because they're jurisdiction specific and they 
um, are actually only available for a few jurisdictions, one of which is Texas. Um, Westlaw actually purchased, or Thomson Reuters purchased ProDoc, I think it was a couple of years ago. So they're integrating it into the Westlaw platform, but I still believe that you can buy the CD-ROMs of ProDoc with those pre-crafted forms um, online, at least as of now, they're still selling that CD-ROM version. A lot of attorneys will use Microsoft Word for document assembly. Not as efficient, but you can create your own templates that way. Um, so just keep that in mind. I don't know if any of you are using ProDoc or HotDocs or anything like that. Kind of the old-fashioned way, of, which is totally you know, great, but there are some things you might want to look into that may help with that automation um, of, of all your, your legal documents. The AB Day doesn't have a comparison chart for DocAssembly, but they do have a page on their website that's devoted to this topic, so you can go in and learn a little bit more about document assembly software. Okay, so next up we have cloud computing, which sounds kind of fancy and technical, but it's really not. Um, basically, this is web-based software, and what that means is that it's software that can be accessed over the internet anywhere that you have a browser. It's not something that you download onto your computer. You can go to a website, log onto that website, and access all of the data that's available for that particular software. But because you go to a website, the data is st stored on remote servers. It isn't served, stored on your server or on your computer in your office. So the data that you put in there, including your client data, is going to be stored by a third party. <clears throat> and the benefit of that is that you can access that data from anywhere. So if you like to work from home or you like to log on and look at information when you are at the courthouse or something like that, that's great. It has that ease of access. But as this has become more and more popular, the ethics of this type of arrangement have started to be questioned a little bit. And many states have actually issued ethics opinions specifically regarding uh, cloud computing for attorneys. And the link I provided here has information about the different ethics opinions from around the United States. Let me click on that. It's got a little chart to show you how many states have done this. And so the states in blue have issued a specific ethics opinions for attorneys about cloud-based software. And you see that Texas isn't highlighted. Um, but what you can do is you can kind of scroll down. It kind of gives a summary of what each of the, the states have said. And so kind of what the standard is, you can see reasonable care, you have to have reasonable care, which sounds like such an attorney thing to say. But, you know, it's, they're a little bit different. Every state's a little different. Consult an expert or lawyers have to have ownership and access to the data can't, that can't be hindered. Um, you need to investigate the provider's security measures. Um, ensure unfettered access to the data. So it's about kind of looking into What's the security measures put in place by this particular software or this particular company and making sure that they can't intervene and keep you from getting access to um, your particular client's data. So those are the types of things they seem to be kind of seeing over and over, some of the themes that tend to emerge. And so just because Texas doesn't have an ethics opinion, it doesn't mean you can kind of use cloud services willy-nilly. We do have um, you know, rules here in Texas, ethics rules having to do with the confidentiality of client information and safeguarding client property. So it's possible that Texas is going to some, at some point get an ethics opinion, but what I would say is take a look at what some of these other states require because it's probably going to be something similar when it happens in Texas and then you have an argument to say, no, this is what I'm doing to try to safeguard uh, my client's data that I'm using through cloud-based services. So regarding popular cloud computing products, many attorneys use general ones that aren't necessarily law practice specific. Uh, popular choices are Dropbox, Google Docs, iCloud. You probably actually, if you don't use these for work, maybe use them personally. If you have a mobile device, you probably save stuff to iCloud or Dropbox or something like that. Popular legal choices among solo and small firm attorneys are Clio, My Case, and Rocket Matter. You may have heard of one of these more recently. They've become very, very popular. These are actually practice management softwares, but they are cloud-based, which is why I've listed them here when I talk about cloud computing. Um, so if you think you want some sort of practice management software, but you want to have that ease of remote access, uh, these are becoming really popular uh, with attorneys. Clio and Rocket Matter I hear more and more about um, all the time. 
So the ABA case and practice management software comparison chart that I showed before does incorporate information about cloud-based practice management uh, services into it. So next up is eDiscovery. Um, eDiscovery software is really used to help you manage electronically stored information. So a lot of people tend to think of eDiscovery as something that big law firms do, um, not solos and small firms. Um, the ABA Tech Report, uh, the 2016 version, I was able to find it in that, but not this newest version. It had information um, about whether solos and small firms are involved um, with electronic discovery and managing electronically stored information. And what they found is about a third of these attorneys say they do have some involvement with e-discovery. I'm surprised it's not more. Maybe people don't think of themselves as doing e-discovery. But the way that we use technology today and the way the information is used today, most cases may involve some electronically stored information. You have Word documents, you have email, you have text messages, you have Excel spreadsheets, you have PDF. All of that is electronically stored information. So if you kind of have to go through those, um, you are dealing with electronically stored information. So typically, again, e-discovery is thought of as being very, very expensive. You have teams of attorneys doing document review, hiring outside consultants, and those sorts of things. But there are softwares out there that are now geared toward helping solo and small firm attorneys with e-discovery. And they're basically there to help you with the whole process of e-discovery. What these softwares do is help you with collecting the data. So you have to pull it from wherever it was originally stored. And then you have to get it into your system and process that in some way. You, you also have to get it organized and you want to zero in on all of the relevant files. <coughs> so these uh, services will often have keyword searching capabilities or filters to help you say, I want to just see the emails from this particular party going to this particular party. Or there may be search algorithms that kind of work behind the scenes to help you find um, the information you need. If you're searching through your client's data because you want to hand that data over to the other side they've requested to get some information, you may be going to go in and redact certain things or you want to pull out privileged documents. So these softwares can help you do that quickly um, so that you're not giving something over to the other side that you would consider privileged. If you want to produce that data for the other side, they can often help you get it in a more manageable format and then securely send it over um, via a portal or via email um, to that other side. So, like I said, they're kind of help you from start to finish and there are products, again, that are available um, that are kind of emerging to help solos and small firms. So the ABA Tech Report didn't have information about the most popular e-discovery flat platforms for this audience. Um, that's a free report. They have a fuller version that comes out every spring. Um, it's about $2,000. The joke I always say is about $2,000 stands between me and getting access to the full set of data. Um, so I was able to find an ABA article regarding what some of the popular choices are. And so I've listed here so that you can get an idea of what uh, might be available for solo and small firms. So next up are mobile apps, which is probably the thing you're most, maybe most familiar with using on a day-to-day -day basis, just personally or professionally. Excuse me. Mobile apps, these are software programs that are designed to run on mobile devices like tablets, smartphones, and that sort of thing. Apps are device specific. So if you have an iPhone or an iPad, you're going to have to download iOS devices, the Apple operating system. If you have an Android device, you're going to have to get the ones that are made for Androids. There are also what are called mobile websites, which are basically mobile-friendly versions of the full website that are optimized to run. There are millions of apps available. The iTunes App Store has over 2 million apps. Same for Google Play, which has the Android apps. There are just millions of these things uh, that have been created. BlackBerry and Windows will also have apps, but the selection is a lot more limited. Um, most attorneys, if you look at kind of the tech information available, most attorneys use iPhone. The majority will use iPhone, so they're looking at iPhone apps uh, as well. So there are millions of apps. Those certainly aren't all geared toward the legal market, but there are at least hundreds of apps that are geared toward this legal market, maybe thousands or so, maybe thousands. Um, the ABA Legal Technology Report asked all attorneys um, which apps they have downloaded. And so this data is from the end of 2016, and this is the list of the most downloaded apps uh, by all attorneys, not just solo and small firm. So the most downloaded 
are the legal research apps. So Westlaw and Lexis Advance both have an app. What you want to keep in mind is they are free to download, but you will have to have a subscription to these services to actually use those particular uh, legal research platforms. Fastcase is free to download and it's free to use if it's the app version. And then never forget, as a Texas attorneys, you have access to free Fastcase, as well as Casemaker, which isn't listed up here, but Casemaker has an app as well. Um, next is the Legal Dictionary app. Maybe Blacks, uh, they, they have an app. Um, trial Pad and Transcript Pad are iPad apps to help with um, trial presentation, as well as annotating transcripts. Maybe if you want to annotate a deposition or something like that on your iPad, you can use something like um, the Transcript Pad app. CourtLink allows you to track court dockets and create alerts. So if something's been filed by the other side, you can get a, an app on your phone that will tell you, you know, you need to check the docket. Something's been filed. Um, there are some news apps. Lexus has a news app. They list Westlaw News, but that isn't a real thing. I believe it's the Thomson Reuters um, uh, app. They have a news app. Um, the Lexus Get Cases and Shepherdize is basically a stripped down version of Lexus Advance, so it's going to allow you to pull cases and shepherdize stuff quickly. Uh, maybe you're in court or something and you want to check a case or something like that. That can be really helpful for that. Uh, Clio is listed up here. If you remember, I mentioned Clio. It's a really popular uh, cloud-based practice management software. And so what's really interesting is it is so popular that it has become one of the most downloaded apps overall. Um, by attorneys, so that's something you might want to keep in mind. So like I said, there are a lot of apps out there. Um, what you see here is that actually there's this huge category of other at the bottom, about a quarter of the apps that are most downloaded are some sort of other app. Um, and that's just because there are so many apps available, things with jury selection or help you with mediation, or there's just all sorts of things that might be available. And so what I always like to do is to give people a little bit of information about where they can go find um, more apps that may be geared toward the legal market. So what I always like to talk about is the iPhone JD blog, which is a blog for attorneys who use iPhones and iPads. But what you want to keep in mind is even if you're an Android user, lots of different vendors may create an iPhone app and then also have an Android app. So if you're an Android user, this can also be a really helpful website as well. Let me go show you that. What they have is an index to every blog post they've done, what they call the index to their prior posts. So you can go in and see, okay, they've reviewed something like, let me see one that's been reviewed. Sometimes they review things over and over again. So something called Case Manager app. They reviewed it in 2012, 14, 14, 15, and 15. So they may go back something, there's a new version or something they want to go and, and tell you like what's been updated. So it's really helpful um, to be able to go into these different blog posts. They're really fairly comprehensive. They kind of give a multi-paragraph narrative about the app with screenshots, which is also really helpful to kind of show you um, a little bit more in depth um, about that app. <clears throat> I can tell you a little bit more about how useful it's going to be. The UCLA Law Library has also put together a mobile apps guide. I like to show this one to people because if you Google what are the best legal apps, you're often going to get some small article listing five apps from 2015. Not so helpful. So I always like to kind of plug law librarians who are continually updating research guides to give you more information that may be more up to date um, about new apps that may have come out. So this one does get updated fairly frequently. So it's another source where you can go and look at some um, apps that may be available. Okay. So the last type of technology that I want to mention are what I call basic office technologies, things like Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, and Adobe Acrobat um, for PDFs. And you may be a little bit confused about why I'm bringing up this type of technology since you probably use this every day. It turns out that most of us, including me, think we know how to use these effectively, but there's a lot of features that we don't really know exist and could save us a lot of time uh, when we're using these types of softwares. So I don't know if any of you have heard of the Legal Tech Audit. You may have had another speaker here kind of talk about that, or Casey Flaherty. Um, he was corporate counsel at Kia Motors, and he would send a tech test to outside firms because he didn't want to pay attorneys for the time spent inefficiently using Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, and some of these other technologies. 
Um, so he gave them a test, and what he's found is that most attorneys don't know how to use these things, really. Um, they kind of use them day to day for what they know how to do, but they don't really know how to use all of those time-saving things um, in these technologies. So I put a link here if you're interested in learning about the tech audit. Um, some companies are now requiring attorneys to take this. A lot of like Fortune 500 companies are now requiring, they're going to say, Associate X is not allowed to work on any matters because they, are not, they failed this tech test. But Associate Y, they can work on all of my matters because they're really tech savvy in Microsoft Word and they know how to use this efficiently. It's happening and so it's maybe going that way to make sure people know a little bit more about technology. So what you also may be most interested in is the uh, Legal Tech Audit has a list of skills that they test on. Okay. So basically they have a list of things in Word. So Word is probably the one I'm pretty familiar with. So you see the things here that they test on. Some of you easily, you want to align text to the left or right. Uh, other things you may not realize how to find and replace all. So if you have a big long document and you want to find all the mentions of a particular party or something like that because you want to change it all or maybe a date has changed or something like that, rather than kind of going through and finding and replacing every single one, you can do a find and replace all and it saves a ton of time. So that's just kind of one example of the type of thing that can save a lot of time. And so um, track changes, using styles to kind of draft your document and that sort of thing. I tend to be a much better user of Word than I am of Excel. Um, and so they list some things in Excel that I don't even recognize what they were doing or what they're wanting me to do. Um, but they kind of have a list here of things that hopefully you should learn to do in Excel. And then some things that you might want to know um, when you're creating PDF documents, things like bait stamping, creating PDF, encrypting the files, um, you know, inserting pages, running character recognition, um, removing links, that sort of thing. So it's a kind of a lot of stuff. Some of it you could kind of, if you ran through the list, you could say, I know it, I know it, I know it. And then you might look at something and think, I have no idea what they're asking me to do. So if that happens and you're kind of wondering, what do I do? How do I learn? Go back. It may seem really simple. But what you may do is just go to these product websites because they make the training available on their website for free. And so I put a link, um, if you're, some links here if you're interested um, in kind of where you can find um, information about training in Microsoft Office or, um, you know, so that would be Word and Excel or if you're interested in Adobe, getting some training on that. Since we kind of have problems linking out, I won't go. But if you go to these, for instance, Adobe User Guided Training site, they have tutorials on basically all of those topics. Maybe not Bates numbering, because that's pretty specific um, to kind of the legal market. But um, you know how to redact things, how to encrypt files, how to merge files in PDF. All of that stuff they go over on the Adobe User website with video tutorials sometimes, or just kind of a screenshot tutorial. So like I said, it may seem simple, but the information is available out there for free on how to do some of these things. And it takes a lot of time on the front end to learn how to do this stuff with this technology, but what they found is that it's really going to save you a lot of time in the long run if you know how to use these effectively. Okay. So those are the softwares I wanted to go over. I just wanted to touch briefly on technology selection. So when you're setting out to select or acquire a particular legal software, there are some general things that you might want to consider. Uh, the ABA has put together a checklist for purchasing software for the law office. Um, it's available from the Legal Technology Research Center and some various uh, links that I've given you today um, are to that particular site. So to do, before you kind of do anything, you may want to think about what your needs are um, and conduct a self-assessment. So how do you work? Do you work at home? Do you like to work at the office? Do you probably do both, to be honest? Um, are you always kind of in court? You need to be able to work at the courthouse and that sort of thing. What's your comfort letter level with technology? Are you kind of a beginner? Or can you do something that's got a few or more advanced options? What are the necessities for the particular type of technology that you're looking for? And then what is your budget, which is really important. Um, the tech report did ask solo and small firms, and about a third of them or so, I believe, have some sort of budget for technology for their office. Um, most of them, though, was under about $3,000. So uh, that was kind of the, the largest group there. 
So you'll want to research your options, obviously, and hopefully I've given you some resources for how you can go out and just find out what some of these options are. Um, who are the vendors and what kind of products do they have? And then you may ask your colleagues, right? You know, what are you using? Do you like it? Why not? What do you like about it? So that you can just find out a little bit more about what these things are. Then you might just pick a couple of them and give them a shot. Most of these vendors will give you a free trial to allow you to demo this sort of thing. So you may get like a free week or month or something. I would say if you're going to have um, demo something and you have staff, say you have a paralegal or a legal assistant, I would advise you to have that person try it as well because they're going to have to use it uh, with you. Um, and then just take that time to evaluate the product. Does it meet your must have? Uh, is it actually going to help you be efficient or is it just kind of technology for technology's sake? You don't want to do that either. You don't want to spend all this money on some product and then find that you're not using it because it's not really helpful to you. So really kind of reflect on that when you're um, trying it out. If you decide to buy it or you, you want to move forward possibly, there are some things you may also want to consider, things like how many licenses are you going to need? Is it licensed per user or is it licensed per firm size, like up to five users? Is it an annual fee? Is there a support contract? So will you get those annual updates for free or are you going to have to pay for some sort of support going forward as well as the initial fee? Uh, this checklist goes into some of those questions so you can kind of think about when you go into talking to a vendor what do I really need to consider um, when I'm purchasing this type of software? When you go to implement, make sure you, everyone knows it's going to happen, everyone's on board and actually committed to using it. Again, there's that situation where you may buy something and then find out that no one wants to use it. Arrange for training, um, either in person or a lot of them will do like an online training. Like they'll kind of do, they'll take over your screen and you guys can kind of web, do like a WebEx or something like that where you can get training that way. Um, so those are just some things you might want to consider. The checklist that I have linked up here actually has more things than I went over, um, but it's just kind of to give you an idea of what you might want to think about. So that's kind of what I wanted to mention about selection. Uh, since technology is always changing all the time, I wanted to give you some resources, things that you may use to kind of stay um, up to date um, in this area. And these um, are geared towards solo and small firms, some of them. Uh, the Techno Lawyer newsletters are geared um, have some that are geared towards solo and small firms. <clears throat> so this is their website. These are free newsletters that you can sign up for. So they have one for small law, they have one for big law, they have one for litigators. So you can kind of keep up with technology that may be geared uh, toward those particular groups. I won't go into the other sites. The ABA Law Technology Today website, I've talked a lot about ABA resources. This is their blog style um, publication, so they're always kind of feeding information about new products and, and new um, information into the blog as it gets updated daily or weekly. Um, and then there's the Lawyerist website, which is a website that's geared towards small firm attorneys. And so they have a lot of information about practice management software and time and billing software and things like that that may be interesting um, for solo and small firms. So there are other things out there that you might use to stay up to date, but these are just a few places that I thought could get you started. There are some other resources that didn't really fit into the presentation today. Um, <clears throat> one is the Solo and Small Firm uh, Legal Technology Guide. It's an annual publication, and I believe the 2016 edition is available here at the Harris County Law Library at the front desk, so you can kind of get an idea. Some of the information that um, I use kind of big picture of the types of things that attorneys are using, um, I, I was able to get from that particular publication as well. And then I also just wanted to plug the Harris County Legal Tech Institute. In addition to this presentation, some of you have probably been to their other <laughs> presentations. All of those are available now online, right? So all of those are now online, um, and they will continue to put these presentations online. But in addition to those, they also have various legal technology links and other resources um, that may be helpful for attorneys who are interested in this particular topic. So that's all that I wanted to go over today. Does anyone have questions? I know the slides will go up at some point, right? With yes, the links? So okay. It's okay with you. Um, mm -hmm. I plan to send it out to everybody who's here today as, uh, uh, along with the survey, just to ask you know, how you uh, value the program. Okay. Does anyone have questions about anything? Hearing about a new product, uh, the name is Praxis. Praxis practice, some combination of everything that I see some solo attorneys. 
are using. So it's like a practice management. It's got everything. And yeah. that's kind of the trend is that people kind of want this one product that will do hopefully everything they want. Is every time you go with a product like that, it gets sold or discontinued, and mm -hmm. then you're really in a lurch. Mm -hmm. Yes. So things like compatibility, was it going to be, can you export that data into a new program? You don't think about that when you buy something, but it be, can become really important if you're going to have to switch. <laughs> so, but I haven't heard of that particular one much. All right, well, thank you. I hope you all learned a little something. I appreciate your time. <laughs> For more learning opportunities like this, including online tutorials and in-person training sessions, visit the Harris County Law Library's Legal Tech Institute website at www.harriscountylawlibrary.org slash tech.